let's go back to the fact that I'm a mathematician. I don't really believe in the psychology of trading. I think you need to set down your rules, test your rules, prove that they work and follow your rules. That's my psychology. Welcome back everyone to Dancing Down with Sunny G. Harris. We have a lot to talk about, including her progression as a trader. She's been one of the female traders that I admire, who's been really able to do a lot for trading and kind of keep it in long term. So Sunny, how's it going? Welcome to the podcast today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hey, good to have you here for sure. We have a lot to talk about. So for people who don't know you too much right now, tell them a bit more about who you are and kind of what you do these days. Oh, golly. Well, I trade every day. Uh, that's what I do. I watch the markets all day long and trade when I see trades. And I have a, a website called moneymentor.com. And I do a trading room on Tuesday mornings for an hour. And I write a sunny side of the street newsletter every Sunday night. And I'm a, I'm a mathematician and a programmer and a photographer. So I I uh, I do a lot of programming. I've programmed all my own indicators, the things that I use for my own trading. I've programmed. Interesting. Sounds like a, a lot of stuff there for sure. I, I kind of want to go back in time and tell me as a programmer, someone who's who studied mathematics, why did you come to trading? What was the, the inspiration for you to kind of get started with trading? Well, I had a little company, a little software company. We did computer graphics, one of the first in the world to do it. In the 1974 is when I started. And uh, by 1980, I was retiring. And uh, maybe I started in 72. Anyway, by 1980, I was retiring from there and sold my, uh, I was 30 years old and sold my share of the company and retired. And so I traveled a little bit and did some genealogy research and a few things like that. And I realized I was bored. And in the meantime, I had given my money, the what I got from selling the company, to what I thought was the right thing to do because I didn't know anything about trading or economics or investing or anything. So I gave my money to money managers. And it took them three weeks to lose $75,000. And so... I decided I could do that poorly on my own. And I started reading and researching and plotting charts on graph paper and reading Investors Daily. It was not Investors Business Daily yet. And I would read that every morning and plot the charts of yesterday's data and look at where I thought the markets were going. And that's how I got started. So how was the learning curve from there? Did you learn from the start and kind of get good results with your own money from the start? Did you have to go through a certain learning curve to, to get there? Well, I had a, I had a good stockbroker who helped me. Um, you know, you didn't, there wasn't any electronic trading at that time. And, and I had a really good stockbroker and he taught me things and showed me things and helped me figure out what to invest in. And we did really well. And I was not only in, investing in stocks. I was do doing municipal bonds and land deals and gold and diamonds and, you know, all kinds of things. If it, As far as I'm concerned, if it moves, you can trade it. He even said to me, why don't you try trading futures? And I thought, no, the people who lost $75,000 for me uh, were trading futures and I'll never trade futures. <laughs> Ah, famous last words, right? I mean, now I trade futures every day. <laughs> How did that change from going from investing? Because back then it was probably more investing to then now actively trading. How did that evolve? I was plotting these charts and I showed them to my broker and, and said, you know, we're going to have a crash. This was in September of 87. And I said, sell everything that I own. I want out of this. I think it's going to go down sharply. And so he said, no, that's this is the biggest bull run in history. You don't know anything about these charts mean nothing. And you don't know anything really about the stock market. And I said, well, it's my money, so let's sell it all. So we sold out, cleared everything out of the market, and the market crashed in October. And then on, so it crashed 105 points on Friday. It crashed 506 points on Monday. On Tuesday, I called him and said, buy everything you can get your hands on. So that was it. That was, I was hooked. 
that was trading. And and that's I started trading the S and P in eighty two, I think. But I started trading the S and P, and I was trading it on daily charts at the time because we didn't have access to real time data yet. And I was I was hooked from there on. What was trading like back then compared to today? It's something I like to ask people who've been there for a long time, maybe traded like a couple of years ago. And trading back then was different than, than it is today on like the charts, the fence technologies we have. What was different back then? Was it do you think easier or, or just different back then? Or what was the difference? Well, it wasn't easier. I mean, it's it's always been a challenge. But uh, you know, it was much slower back then. You could trade daily charts and and do really well. And uh it, it was just slower moving and now it just moves so quickly. And you know, it just today was for instance, this morning it started out just chopping back and forth, back and forth. And it didn't do that back then. And uh, you know, we didn't have real time data. We had to uh look at end of day data for everything. There really wasn't any software yet. Um the first software was by Tim Slater, it was called CompuTrack. And uh I used that in the beginning and then I switched over to uh system writer which was made by the people who are now trade station so i started using system writer as soon as it became available in 1986 and uh i i bought data tick data from a little company called tick data inc and i would massage it into 15 minute increments and create my own charts that look like 15 minute charts but the Computer thought they were daily charts, so uh, you know you had to you had to play around with things back then. You had to be creative. Was it easy for you to go from trading daily charts to going intraday more, or was it a natural progression? It was just a natural progression. Yeah, I, I mean, I knew I wanted to see more inside the market than daily data allowed me, and so I, like I said, I created these fifteen-minute charts, and from there I went to five-minute charts and. Actually, I traded 15-minute charts for quite a while, and uh, then it just got faster and faster. And now I trade five-minute and one-minute charts. Wow, that's a big difference. You know, but I've, I've been around. I've been trading for 42 years, so I've seen a lot of changes happen over the years. Do you feel like the markets are different these days? They behave different ways, or is it the same move, the same kind of patterns you had many, many years ago? Good question. It's it's the same patterns, just on a different time frame. I mean, we have we still have up markets, down markets, and sideways markets, and that's that's the whole game. So the the trends now are on shorter term charts. I mean, on the daily chart, you can go sideways forever, but on a five minute chart of the very same thing, you can pull out lots of trades. Does that mean that the daily charts now are tougher to trade or, or not really appealing to trade? Or is it just a different way to adapt to them? I trade daily charts for stocks. I mean, I trade stocks and, and uh, I, I guess I swing trade them, but I hold them for weeks to months. And, uh, you know, I trade the E-mini on a five minute and one minute charts and I'm in and out. I, it's a day trading thing. I get out at the end of every day, get in in the morning and get out at the end of every day. Whereas with stocks, I'll hold them overnight and hold them for what I call long term. Uh, long term is weeks to months now. I'm sure people are going to want to know sort of what's your trading style and what are some things you look at. Do you want to share a bit more about kind of any kind of patterns or things you, you like to look at? Well, I created a, what I call my dynamic moving average uh, quite some time ago. And what it does is I realized that moving averages produce a lot of whipsaw. So you can you can find a trend up or down, but in the sideways periods, and markets trend 30% of the time, and they're going sideways 70% of the time. So when these moving averages cross back and forth, back and forth, you get whipsawed and lose all the money you made in the trend. So I created mathematics for what I call my dynamic moving average, and it computes its own lengths internally. So Whereas a standard moving average might have like nine and 18 for the inputs uh, for length one and short length and long length. Uh, my moving average doesn't. It, it calculates its own lengths internally and it 
very rarely whipsaws. So I, then I created uh, bands on either side of that dynamic moving system of dynamic moving averages. And I call that my sunny bands. And that's what I use exclusively. I trade everything I trade with sunny bands. And the bands help you find extreme points in terms of catching reversals. They help you to see when the market is like uh, having some momentum. Yeah, it's in a way. Um, the bands are 1.2 and 2.0 average true ranges away from the dynamic moving average. And that seems to contain price really well. So price goes back and forth between the bands. And it's it's really pretty easy to use. I'm sure you're aware of, of bunch bands, definitely. Uh, something I use myself a little bit. Why having a average true range versus a standard deviation for, for the bands? Is it different in your opinion? Or is it the, the same thing overall? Yes, it is. Standard deviation tells the market where it should go statistically. Average true range measures where the market is going. So if, if you put Bollinger Bands and Sunny Bands on a chart, they don't look alike. Yes, they're both bands, but his is around a simple moving average, which whipsaws. And mine's around a dynamic moving average, which doesn't whipsaw, or at least not very much. And the standard deviation goes pretty far outside of price. So uh, Bollinger Bands and Kel Keltner Channels both don't look like Sunny Bands. Do you feel like having your custom indicators is something that, that you recommend to like new traders to be able to kind of focus on something or, or at least kind of develop their own way of trading? Yeah, I think that that's a good idea. Uh, if you can decipher the markets and figure out what works, and I'm always asking what the question, what is true? So I look at price on a chart and I, and I look at various indicators, including my own, and I say, what is true of price with respect to this indicator? So anybody that wants to develop their own just has to ask the question, what is true over and over again? Do you feel like any in the indicators available to the public, is there a lot that's true in those indicators or, or is there a lot that's actually not true? Because people tend to kind of go with these, these indicators a bit blindly sometimes without knowing when they work, when they don't work and kind of how to use them. Most of the time they don't work. Um, I, I draw trend lines and uh, support and resistance on my charts. And I call them attractors because price tends to be attracted to these levels. Fibonacci levels are also attractors. Moving averages are also attractors. And you'll find that price gets attracted back and forth to these levels. So I draw those on my charts in addition to sunny bands. And I just watch price go back and forth within all these levels. I'm curious to hear, as someone who has a lot of experience in the market, how much chart time do you do compared to trading time? Because a lot of people feel like the charts is for trading, they got to get their chart, they got to place trades. But I think that sometimes you can get better results by just observing the market like you're doing. Uh, is this something you do a lot to just observe and not necessarily place trades? Absolutely. I'm still learning. You know, I've been trading for 42 years, but I'm still learning every day. I print out my charts every night. I've got notebooks full of charts. I print them out every night and I analyze them and I study them and get ready for the next morning. And I study my charts while I'm trading. I think chart time is really important. So you actually print out your chart on paper and then you kind of use them on paper. I do. I print out color charts every night. And what's the benefit of that? I, I'm sure there's an aspect with the pen, the paper, the, the fact that you can kind of train your brain better on it. What is the benefit of that? Well, you're right. It, when you when you do pen to paper, you learn more from it. And remember, I started out plotting charts on a piece of graph paper. So I find that when you do it by hand, you learn a lot more from it. You learn a lot more from the moves. I also have another indicator that I call PHW. It stands for Potential Hourly Wage. And it plots yellow dots at all the ideal turning points. So I'm looking at the yellow dots with respect to my own indicator, Sunny Bands. And I'm saying, what did Sunny Bands do with respect to these yellow dots? And I look at that every single night. Is there anything else I can learn from my own indicator and the way it re behaves with the market? I love that. That, that analysis is definitely something, something useful. Uh, it's actually a couple of years back when I had my very first drawdown of trading full time, I actually printed all my charts and paper and kind of went through pen and paper to go through them. And that's kind of how I found out my mistake back then. 
So I, I definitely see the point there. It's definitely a good way to do it. Uh, I think you have something there for sure. So Yeah, and I, I think uh, calculating things by hand or at least in a spreadsheet is is also important. I mean, if you go back to, what was it, 1972 when Wells Wilder wrote his opus work, all the, all the calculations in there are done on columnar uh, paper so that he calculates everything by hand. And I've done all of his calculations by hand. And uh, I think that's really important. And I think there's something you can learn from muscle memory that you can't from just sitting there and trading. I want your, your, your perspective on being a woman in the, the trading kind of environment, the trading world. Uh, now, I, I believe there's probably more women than there was back then in, in the uh, four years ago. Uh, but even today, there's still not many women in trading overall. Uh, what was it like in the beginning? Kind of How did that transition to today? Well, uh, when I was first trading the S&P, it was the big boy back then. It wasn't the E-mini that we have now. And uh, I had traders on the floor and I would call them up on the phone and tell them, uh, hi, this is Sonny Harris, account number so-and-so, buy uh, 20 S&Ps at the market, uh, front month at the market. And after three days of that, they said, you don't have to say all that anymore. And I said, why? And they said, because you're the only woman that calls the floor. So uh, there weren't very many others. You know, they, uh, I was one of the very few. But it made sense to me to do it. And it, it was just appealing. It was something I really, really liked. Do you feel like that also brought some challenges as a trader to be one of the only women back then? Or did you have to kind of sort of work harder to? No, I've always worked harder. I'm a workaholic. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I still work 12, 14 hours a day, weekends included. I just, I like to work. I like to learn. I like to read. I like to challenge myself in every way I can think of. You know, I used to be afraid of the ocean, so I learned to scuba dive. It's that kind of thing that I do. Whatever I'm, I'm uh, not good at, I work at. I love that. It's awesome. Uh, I have in my note here, you took a pretty big break from trading, a 18 year kind of hiatus from trading. How did that go? And what made you go back? Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. So how did that go? And what made you go back to the market? Well, I didn't really take a break. I, I was raising my daughter's children, both special needs children. And um, I got them when they were infants. And so I took some time off and only did longer term swing trading for eight years. I didn't do the five minute charts during that time. I was still trading. I just wasn't trading the same way I am now. And, you know, as soon as they got out on their own, then I went immediately back to it. How was going back to the five minute chart? Was it a tough transition again or did you, did it came naturally? Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's natural for me. It's, it's, it's the way I see the market. You know, and I, I, I really didn't take much of a break. I say I took a break, but it was just because, you know, when the kids were in school all day long, I'm trading. I couldn't start at 630 in the morning the way I do now back then because I had to get them ready for school. But as soon as they left for school, then I'm trading. I feel like people have a natural personality or natural kind of preference for certain kind of time frame, either the five minutes, like lower time frame or bigger time frames, more like swing trading. In your case, you're kind of doing both. Is it based on experience or is it your personality that's kind of good at doing both? What do you think makes you be able to, to, to do that? Well, I'm a, I am say I'm a double A type personality. I look for the passing lane in the drive through car wash. So I, I like that rapid fire uh, tension. I like stress. So I enjoy the five minute market. How does that translate to bigger time frame like the, the daily chart? Because that takes a longer time to, to unfold. Well, I don't spend as much time looking at the daily charts. I mean, I look at them every night to see where I think they're going. But I don't have to check it every five minutes and be on top of it and watch every tick of the market with those. You know, I can put some Fibonacci lines up and see what's happening and just sort of keep my finger on the pulse of it. But I don't have to watch it every minute it trades. Speaking of personality, your style is that more sort of uh, uh, sort of like methodical, like a lot more systematic based. Like there's very clear rules, clear indicators. Do you feel like some traders can't do that? They kind of need a bit more flexibility sometimes. Or do you feel like that methodical style could fit everyone? Well, yes and no. 
Um, I have a, a friend, Adrian Tograe, who is a trader's uh, coach. She is into the psychology of trading. And she used to say I was very intuitive trader. And I said, no, 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 I'm very methodical. I, I'm not intuitive at all. And over the years, I've discovered that I am intuitive and I I get feelings about the market. And uh, I mean, that's I'm sure how I developed my indicators in the first place was just sensing what the market was doing. Uh, I don't think all people can be that methodical. I mean, you know, I'm a mathematician. I'm kind of rigid person. <laughs> they say. Uh, Anyway, something along the lines that mathematicians don't have as much, as much personality as accountants. This must be a big a big difference between kind of being comfortable with using maths a lot and then having your feelings about the market to being more intuitive. I mean, that that's a big difference. It is a big difference. But I think both are integral to understanding the markets. I mean, you have to have a feeling for it and you have to prove how your feelings work. Is the intuition natural? Is it something you had from day one? Or is, or is intuition something you kind of get and sort of learn over time to use in trading? Yeah, I, I think intuition is developed by lots of practice. It's not something I was born with. Maybe some people are. But I think it comes from lots and lots of practice and lots of looking at charts and lots of handwork, plotting your own charts and looking at the prices and studying. I think the intuition comes from studying. We got to talk about studying a little bit because you've got a big collection of books in the background, which I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, you mentioned it's over 700 books you have for, for trading. So that's that's a lot. Yes. Those are all trading books. None of them are novels. My novels are in another room. Yeah, I've I've read all those. What were some of the the books that kind of mark you the most, the book that made you kind of think more or, or that you learned more than, than other ones. Do you have any like Paul Iman? Yeah, I would have to say John Murphy's uh, financial analysis, technical analysis of the financial markets. That was where I started and it's where I end. It's, I have three copies of it because the first copy I read and read and read and I highlighted everything in yellow so I had to get another one and start over again and read it again. And I basically have that book memorized. And I have a third copy that's not highlighted that he autographed for me. I had lunch with him one day. and I'm So I, I think that's, that's the start and the end of trading right there. Technical Analysis of the Financial Markets by John Murphy. And that's a very thick book also. It's a very big book. It is thick. And I remember I paid $50 for it. It was many years ago and I paid $50 and it was the first book I bought. And I thought, boy, I hope this thing's worth it. That's really expensive. Any book that kind of helps you more with the, the mindset aspect of trading? The, yeah, the, the mindset of psychology around it. Let's go back to the fact that I'm a mathematician. I don't really believe in the psychology of trading. I think you need to set down your rules, test your rules, prove that they work and follow your rules. That's my psychology. Which kind of makes sense because a lot of people are using psychology as an excuse because they don't have rules and then they kind of stick to the rules, but they don't have rules. They don't have proven, proven rules and stuff. So, yeah, if you haven't tested your rules, it's because you don't want to know the answer. That's true. That, that's also very true. I agree. Are you a systematic trader? I'm also systematic. I have a bit of discussion, but very little. Mostly systematic, yeah, in my trading. I think that's where the most success comes from. It's following the rule. For me, it's just, a, it's just a matter of being able to know the rules so you don't make mistakes with them and having a systematic thing where no matter how you feel that day, you can still do it anyway. That's something that I think for me is quite important. I agree. I want to talk about these, um, any kind of tough times or, or, or challenges or, or like uh, sort of failures you had in the market in trading over the past few years. Anything that comes to your mind where that was a, like a tough experience or something you had to go through? Oh, there's lots of them. I, you you get those almost every day as a trader. You have to learn to take the losses. I mean, the losses aren't fun, but you have to learn to take them in order to survive in this business. And I've had two losing years. I mean, where the whole year I didn't make any money. So you have to be able to survive that. I mean, out of 42, that's not bad. But still, it's, it's uh, hard on the ego when you have a losing year. One of them was uh, 19, no, 
2001, the dot-com crash, I lost 11% that year. The the uh, NASDAQ lost, I think, 68% that year. And I lost 11% and I was upset about it. It happens. Right. You say like a job overall, but it, it's about uh, the idea of, yeah, you're a trader, you should be able to make money every year or every month. And that can sometimes create an uh, expectation for, for new new people in training. They have the, the expectation they'll make a good living from it every month. Uh, but that just not, doesn't happen that way all the time. It doesn't happen that way all the time. I mean, if you can have a losing year and still support your family, you're doing pretty well. But you have to be able to do that. That That's very true. What would you say is the uh, the pre-requirement for being able to live as a full-time trader and also like pay your bills and, and be able to kind of make this money with it? Is this having some buffer income? Uh, something else you see is like a pre-requirement for being able to do it well and not stress so much about the money aspect? Gosh, it's hard. You have to put aside. When you're making money, you have to put a lot of it aside so that you'll have a buffer when you're not making money. You just you know, where sometimes the market pays you and sometimes you pay it. That's very true. That's very true. So we got to talk about your books. You also wrote a couple of books over the past few years. You're at seven now, uh, or working at seventh, I believe. What would you tell people to kind of start with if they want to learn from someone like you with love experience in the market? What should they start to learn with those books? Well, I, the first book I wrote was called Trading 101. And I didn't, I didn't think I could write books. And uh, I was writing, I had a magazine. I, I uh, found out that, that Futures Magazine charged $10,000 for a full page ad. And I wanted to run ads for the software that I had. So I decided to start my own magazine, put my own ads in my own magazine and sell ads to other people. So I had a little magazine called Traders Catalog and Resource Guide. It was half yellow pages and half articles. And, uh, you know, I had everybody in the business listed in there. It was before the Internet. And uh, I would write a few articles now and then for that. And an editor from John Wiley and Sons called me and said, we'd like you to write a book. I said, I can't write. She said, well, just write about your own trading. And I said, I trade. That's the end of that. I follow the system. I trade. She said, no, no, no. Write me a table of contents. Okay. So I wrote a table of contents and she said, good, you're hired. We want to write that book. So I wrote the book and lo and behold, I guess I could write. So that became Trading 101, How to Trade Like a Pro. The next book was Trading 102, Getting Down to Business. Then uh, they started doing some electronic trading in the SOS houses. And they asked me to write a book about that. So that's Electronic Day Trading 101. And what did I write next? Getting Started in Trading, which was really a rewrite of Trading 101. So if you're going to buy one of my books, buy Getting Started in Trading, not Trading 101. And, oh, and then I wrote Trade Station Made Easy, which is mm, 746 pages. Talk about a thick book. That one's pretty thick. And that's all about how to use TradeStation and how to write their programming language, Easy Language. So that was that one. And then I wrote a book with my friend Linda Blair, the actress, called Going Vegan. And uh, that was about her vegan lifestyle and her growing up and pictures and recipes and all kinds. It was very interesting and fun to write with her. And now I'm writing, oh, and then I, I uh, ghost wrote a book with Murray Ruggiero called uh, Using Easy Language 9.x. So I wrote that one for him. He did the, all the programming. And now I'm writing one called The Definitive Guide to Trade Stations Easy Language and OOEL Programming. And it's, uh, it's about 1,400 pages. So they, they just keep getting thicker. As someone who loves fast paced trading, do you feel like writing is because it's completely like the, on the opposite of that? Do you feel like that brings sort of like an equilibrium to your trading? It's like a way to, I'd say, relax more or kind of kind of detach from the market. It's a, a way bit. to unwind. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I trade until 1.15 California time and then I write or program. So, you know, trading is only a half day job. So I'm guessing you start pretty early morning for that uh, trading also? 
Yeah, I have to be down in my office at six o'clock in the morning. So I get up at 445 every morning and I'm not a morning person, but I do it. Sleep in on Saturdays and Sundays and I write on Saturdays and Sundays, but it, it does. It's a, it's a balance to the high pace, high frequency trading that I do to uh, just sit down and work on a book. And I've got more books in me yet. I think it's, it's good to have. It's, it's a good balance for sure. And definitely there. So. So where can people find you and find these books and uh, learn from you or, or reach out after this podcast is, is live? They're all on Amazon.com. And you've got the website is MoneyMentor.com. People can reach out to you there directly, I believe. Yeah. And right at the top of the website, it gives my email address and my phone number. So if you want to give me a call, I always appreciate that. I like to talk to people who are learning and want to learn more and ha having struggles and want to uh, recover. You know, I, I like to talk to people who are traders and aspiring traders. Awesome. Definitely. Definitely a lot to learn there from you as well with so many years of, of, of experience in the market. And so I appreciate the advice you gave here for my listeners. I think it's been very useful. It's been a lot we cover here and it's good to talk with you about trading, uh, all these uh, stories you've had, all these experiences and the we do things also very inspiring for people who want to be more like methodical, systematic. So I appreciate that a lot. And hopefully we can catch up in the future uh, pretty soon. That'd be fun. Thank you, Etienne.